You can listen to The Professional Left wherever you get your podcasts, on Netroots Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for December 10th, 2021. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the Cornfield Resistance, where we have learned that Mark Meadows' book makes a Yule fire log that will burn longer than the Fox News Christmas tree. It's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. Wow. Yeah, it, I, it's still burning. It's it's a... As you said earlier, a Zappadan miracle. It's a Zappadan miracle. Everything yeah. this week is a Zappadan miracle. It, it's been burning for five days. We're hoping we're shooting for nine. We'll settle for eight. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think we would allow Mark Meadows' book to cross our threshold. No. Rumors of it and mentions of it and the way it inflicts itself on the news and the fact Correct. that he's this, – This whole new strategy of getting yourself indicted-ish and semi-cooperating – and sort of letting it, letting your ass crack hang out of your pants halfway down, mm-hmm. and then suing the committee for thinking that you want their attention, all to promote a book is is new in my experience. I gotta say, using the criminal justice system to to promote your book when you're a criminal uh, is is quite a new thing in my experience. Well, I have a theory about this. If Tell you, me your theory, if you don't mind. My theory Please. is, and and. I have no I have no basis for this except well, my, suggest, my hunch. <laughs> you have to say my theory, which is mine, and I made it up. Ahem, ahem, my theory <laughs> mm-hmm. about Mark Meadows and David Perdue also. Oh, okay. Um, people that are bending to Trump's will. Yes. Regardless of whether they have any um prediction of success in their right. endeavor the, right. the purpose of all of this is to serve donald trump mm-hmm. and i really believe that trump is slow bankrupting the republican party bleeding them out slowly. bleeding them out yeah. and uh has a this is my guess is mm-hmm. that he has a deal with win red now he announced apparently on the sixth of this month Mm-hmm. That he was parting with Win Red, and if you've been overcharged by Win Red, know that we had nothing to do with that. Not, not, wasn't us. It wasn't. And us. that's why we're se- because we're at war with big tech. We're going to separate from Win sure. Red, mm-hmm. and we need you to test our new donation platform. So come over and donate at our platform. Yeah. It's called meanwhile, Simply Red, but you know yeah, that's now, fine. Well, meanwhile, I went and checked today. Now that announcement was on Trump's mini blog on the sixth. Uh-huh. Today we're recording on the ninth. All of his websites are still pointing to WinRed as their platform. Yeah. yeah, and the the Republican National Committee is at WinRed. Make America Great Again again is at WinRed. You know that's where the mailing the email lists are, and that's where the money's going to come in. Well, now, to be fair, Devin Nunes hadn't had time to change all the links yeah. yet. <laughs> now, see, that's so, it. That may be know. it. Mm-hmm. That may be it. But I do not trust Donald Trump. Oh no! At all? No. Why? Why would and, anyone ever trust any Republican at all over anything? Well, I mean, exactly. You know. But but I think the point is, if you were overcharged at Win Red, mm-hmm. or you know, you they started charging you a hundred dollars a month, which the fine print at Donald Trump's website did that. Yes. Uh, Donald Trump can now say, "Oh, that was Win Red's fault. We're we're using a whole new platform. Come on over and donate to us here." Yeah. And that won't happen, right? It was, and in the meantime, he's still using WinRed, which is a for-profit company. I can't emphasize that enough. Act Blue is not for profit. Right. The Democratic fundraising online fundraising machine, which is very successful, is nonprofit. So right. the the money that you donate goes to the candidate, and then if you decide you want to support the infrastructure of Act Blue. You can tack on ten percent or give them a tip or whatever, and then yes, you're supporting Act Blue. Mm-hmm. But and they ask for that when you donate. But the money you donate for a candidate goes to the candidate. Well, and and this has been endemic throughout the mm-hmm. entire all the Trump years, which which yeah. is yeah. whenever things get hot, suddenly the person who's drawing the heat was a volunteer coffee boy who right. had nothing exactly. to do with anything, yeah. Yeah. and it certainly wasn't us. And you rely on the sort of the roar of cable news and TV and 
general mayhem to cover up the fact that yeah. these assholes are making their once one more escape from one more crime scene, which they're completely responsible for. And we're going to separate from Win Red in two weeks. Sure, sir. sure they are. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, I think that the that's the reason David Perdue is running. I think that's what is behind a lot of what's happened. I mean, I obviously. He, you know, Mark Meadows wants to sell his book to right. everybody. Right. Um, and and I'm sure was terrified by the fact that uh, the January 6th committee is getting phone records from AT&T. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's just happening. So. Yeah. Well, but and and as as we noted, you know, there's no other um, star out there for him to orbit. Right. There is no right. there's one gravity, one point source, one black hole in the in the conservative firmament and you can either crash into it and burn or you can orbit it you can give yourself over to it and mm-hmm. so mark meadows made this sort of half-hearted half-assed you know don't worry i can i can go on one cable news show and say one thing i can go on fox and say the opposite right i can sort of i can play both sides because i'm very clever and republicans are really stupid uh but trump apparently just yanked his leash yep and snapped his neck right back into position and well, and Republican strategists, there's a Republican strategist named, uh, I believe it's Scott Reed, said, David Perdue getting into this race is horrible for the Republican Party. We have we have an incumbent governor, and now he's being primaried by somebody that everybody knows is corrupt. Everyone in Georgia knows, Republican or Democrat, his brand at this point is insider trading. And you know who's to thank for that? Who? The Lincoln Project. <laughs> And, and I'm to lie, blue gal. We all have to thank the Lincoln Project for <laughs> every good thing that happens. Right? And I, I swear they are going to start taking credit for David Brooks's divorce. You know, <laughs> I swear because I, I, I have listed these guys who who got who started off small, got really big on donations from credulous liberals, got very big, then got then it all blew up in their face, and and no one likes them anymore. But now they're sort of marketing themselves as you know. All this internal tension inside the Republican Party. We did that's, that. That's the space we operate in. And <laughs> literally, I've literally heard Rick Wilson say, "You know, we're like um, SEAL Team Six. You know, <laughs> we 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 breach, we open the beachhead, and Democrats should follow us through. We you know we don't do policy. We're not even Democrats. You know, we're we have a whole separate thing we do. And what we do is we create internal dissension. We get into their heads. We operate in the space where we cause conflict between." Marjorie Taylor Greene and so and so, and then they fight, and that's that's us. We did that, and and we attract attention to us because it's not that we're narcissistic losers who just suck up money and give nothing in return. See, we're causing Republicans to notice us so that Democrats can run without opposition, or they're so they're so obsessed with you know what's Rick Wilson doing today. That mm-hmm. Democratic candidate, so you know you're welcome. Yeah, which is I, taking phantom credit for shit that had nothing to do with you, and there's no <laughs> evidence you had any any involvement in it at all, is a brand. I got it. Yeah. So between that and lecturing Democrats, lecturing liberals that we are not taking the threat from the right seriously enough, is that's their business model now. Yeah. So I fully expect them to say, you know, the Brookses were a happy couple until we came along. And we saw the potential for causing conflict between David and his wife. And now, you're welcome, America. Maybe they caused the breakup of David Brooks and conservatism. I don't know. Uh-huh. But um, I, all I know is that the Lincoln Project is 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 responsible for all the good things that have happened to us in the last couple of years, according to go. the Lincoln Project. Now, you want to talk about 10 grain, right? I do. I want to talk about an article at Mock Paper Scissors about cable news. The statistic that Tengrain was talking about, about the viewership of mm-hmm. uh, cable news, that the um, average age of a Fox News viewer is 75 and the average age of an MSNBC viewer is 68. And uh, <laughs> that's really a lot older than I would have expected mm-hmm. for MSNBC. Um, and what we're noticing as we look at these statistics, these viewership statistics, um over at Crooks and Liars, the staff is talking about these things is, you know, all of our readers on Crooks and Liars, 80% of them are reading it on their phones. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, and so everything that we do there has to be formatted so that it looks good on a phone. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that's 
fine. I mean, that's totally doable and smart websites are doing that. Um, it's interesting because you and I spend all of our day on a desktop or a laptop. Right. And, uh, you know, creating content, it's a lot easier <laughs> than well, being on a phone, right? I, I, I'm, I'm putting in mind just, just as a brief aside of the red letter media guys. Yeah. Uh, we're just, we did a, two of them did a review of Dune from the 80s mm -hmm. and the new Dune movie. And the shtick was, oh, you haven't seen the new one yet? Oh, let me call it up on my phone. <laughs> And, and you're going to watch it. Dune on your phone. <laughs> and he holds it for the other guy for like two minutes and we're all going, oh, okay, I get it. So, yeah, some things are not built to be optimized for telephones. No. I hate to break it to our, our younger listeners and viewers. Um, but that is the world that. Well, speaking of that, of the old Dune, David Lynch was the one yeah. who said, you know, I'm not going to make a movie for a fucking phone. I'm right. just not going to do Bless it. Right? Bless his heart. Bless yeah. his But there are some things, you know, that, that are that need to be optimized for use on yeah, smartphones right, and personal right. devices. But, yeah. but my point is, is that, um, you know, news junkies like us talk about cable news all the time. And one of the reasons we do is we know the influence that it has on Washington, D.C. and New York. Exactly. And exactly. the decision makers, yeah. uh, you know, corporate boardrooms and so forth, watch Morning Joe and CNBC yes. Yes. to get the news. And, and then they make decisions either based on that or it's a totally incestuous relationship where their you know corporate media is just as much in bed with corporations as uh the Republican party so um but and 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 that's why we talk about it yes but it is important if we are talking about activism to recognize i mean if i was a candidate running for office i've said this before i would much rather be on the daily show or Colbert than to be on Nicole Wallace. Right. Oh, it yeah, makes absolutely. no sense to be mm -hmm. on, uh, you know, a cable news show to get your message out when the audience, ju the audience of voters under retirement age, it just isn't there. Right. No. So uh, your social media back. game and so forth is much, much more important. Um, well, and, 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 the flip side of that really is this is why, as we've noted on this podcast once or twice in the past, why CPAC camps out in Washington, D.C. Yeah, right. Um, because right. to be I, it, it always it always amused me. And and it was very educational, especially when I worked for the city of Chicago, that proximity to power is power. Yeah. If you yeah. sit outside the mayor's office, whatever your position is, you have a whole lot more actual power power actual mm -hmm. authority over mm -hmm. things influence over things going on in the city than if you are 20 blocks away in your fancy office and you when i do. did consultant work on uh telling a new blogger who was writing about budgets right i remember know, that yeah yeah what do i need to do to get traffic up and i said don't get traffic up no. get the budget directors of governor's offices mm -hmm. to read your blog <laughs> And then everybody else will follow, you know, exactly. send messages to the important people who need the information you provide. And the, and his was an informational blog. So anyway, uh, we're getting off track a little bit, but um, the 10 grain article is worth reading because it sort of put things in perspective in terms of activism that it's much more important to connect to people where they are and yes. they are not watching, you know, Lawrence O'Donnell. They're not watching Lawrence O'Donnell. So, and, and just for those of you who feel young but really aren't, they're not watching Arsenio Hall either. So, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> Bill Clinton playing saxophone on Arsenio Hall. Oh, that's, that's so edgy. edgy. I that's don't know the, if I would have done that. Sis. Oh, I don't know. So disrespectful. It's like he doesn't take <laughs> politics seriously. <laughs> Yeah, Remember okay. that controversy? Those oh, were yeah. the days. Oh, man. Oh, my God. <laughs> David Gergen chiding Bill Clinton for playing the saxophone on Arsenio Hall. I can, I can oh, imagine a, a young Tom Nichols just shitting himself. <laughs> How dare he defile the good zaba, 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 zaba. <laughs> And then, you know, B Bill, what's his name in his book of fucking virtues? It turns out, oh, you're <laughs> a degenerate gambler. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you never met any of this shit. You just got angry that. Democrats were doing it and it interfered with your, you know, hippie punching. Yeah. yeah. Um, and speaking of inbred <laughs> beltway <laughs> contagion, it, it, 
it is it is a closed system. Yeah. Now, I normally do not watch The Morning Joe because I know what they're going to do. I've 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 done my time. I've done my penance. I you know, that's why I don't watch Beat the Press much anymore. I know it's like watching the same Punch and Judy puppet show, you know, for the thousandth time. I know exactly what they're going to do. There's no mystery to me. But I was up in the morning early early uh this week and decided just to see what's going on over there. What's going on with these kids over, uh, uh, beyond the fence? I turned it on and there's David fucking Brooks. <laughs> like, oh, okay, that's my day now. And within, I don't know, an hour or so, I have a barrage of incoming emails saying, dude, <laughs> did you see? Um, yeah, apparently uh, David Brooks is divorcing conservatism and and uh, has been seen around town canoodling with younger, hotter ideology. So, you know, that's, but that's the closed system. He wrote an article in The Atlantic in which he suddenly discovered that conservatism is kind of racist and stupid and wrong and bad. And it, it certainly isn't the the glorious conservatism of his youth, which he is entirely imaginary. Um, but he wrote that in the Atlantic, which means, of course, he's going to be on cable news because this is now this is this is the exact mirror opposite of what happened to Norman Ornstein and Thomas Mann. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, who wrote a, a very clear and very th- uh, well researched article. These, these were two very established, middle of the road um, political um, experts, uh, people who understand the the philosophy and the psychology and and the sociology of politics. Been writing about it forever. Said, you know what? Basically, the problem is the Republican Party. It's not both. It's not both. It's not both. And they were immediately, you know, sent off to Coventry. <laughs> they were sent to Siberia. You, the, no one's won't see him no more. They were just gone. They were gone from the scene because you're not allowed to say it's one party, not the other, even though it's patently obvious. And even though everyone who sent them off into exile, goddamn well knew it was true. Mm -hmm. Jump forward 10 years. David Brooks is writing an article for The Atlantic. He still has his New York Times job. So, hey, you know, he needs more work. Um, Writes an article about how the death of conservatism and conservatism is dying and it ain't the conservatism of my youth. And and it was still that kind of mealy mouthed. You know, aw shucks, you know, it it wasn't that Bill Buckley was a racist, which he most emphatically was. Mm -hmm. It's that, you know, he was just a jerk. He was a jerk uh, in a debate on television. You know, he was my hero and my mentor. I love him to death and I want to be like him. I dress like him and I want to I want to sound like him. I like to have a boat like him. But, you know, on the subject of race, he was he was a jerk. No, he was racist. (laughs) And your party has been racist your entire adult life. And that's just something that David Brooks can't, cannot come to terms with. Um, and I remember quite distinctly when, uh, I forget who it was, it was one of his fellow New York Times columnists, uh, who has since gone on to other things, mm-hmm. wrote an article about uh, Ronald Reagan and his racist 1980 campaign. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the, what we all on this podcast know, the, the, the Young Bucks comments and the welfare queen comments and going down to Philadelphia, Mississippi to talk about states' rights, goddamn well knowing exactly who he was talking to and exactly how they would interpret that. And David Brooks, who says, who sp- and spent his career saying terribly untrue things, mm-hmm. terribly damaging things in a real soft kind of aw shucks, milk toast kind of way with little squinty glasses so that you wouldn't notice that he's pouring poison in your ear. Mm-hmm. Lost his shit. Mm-hmm. And like, oh, really? how dare you? How dare you say Ronald Reagan was a racist or you did racist stuff? And he, yeah, which is in violation of every New York Times. You're not supposed to talk about each other protocol. Can I can I make a a comment that takes this in a little bit of a different direction? Of course. Uh, I think David Brooks and and his ilk uh-huh. always thought of their party as not racist because it's impolite to talk about racism at sure. cocktail parties. Yeah. And you're having Chardonnay with with Chris Matthews and, you know, whoever else in in a cocktail party, you know, Washington, D.C. Beltway book launch party for Mark Meadows. Um, you, you don't talk about, you know, race, the blacks. You don't talk about that because that's no. not polite. Mm-hmm. Polite conversation isn't about that, even right. though there will be maybe two black people in the entire room. And, you know, one of them is a U.S. senator, Mm -hmm. (laughs) a Republican U.S. senator. Um, I think white people in general have that problem. Yes. 
And we on the left are being, uh, white people on the left, I'm talking about myself, Mm -hmm. are being pushed to realize that being polite about racism isn't enough. No. And uh, we're being pushed to be anti-racist. And that's a whole lesson that, you know, can take a long time to learn. And we do the, you know, we do the work. We're trying to, I'm trying to do the work. And it seems like it's a white problem in addition to a conservative problem. I guess that's all I want oh, yeah. to say. No, I, I so, couldn't agree more. That's I, yeah. I, you know, I have um, uh, different experience than a lot of people, but yeah. I couldn't agree more. I, I, yeah. I know I'm, I'm perfectly aware of the, of the privilege I walk out the door with every time right. I go outside. Right. You and I have no influence over anything. Right. Right. We don't, we don't have vast audiences reading our stuff like, like scripture. We don't have influence. We're not invited to the White House to whisper in the ears of presidents. We, we only we, have the important people listening to us. Drift well, yeah, we have we have the best people. We have the, the sexiest and, and most sweet smelling people. But we don't have you know vast influence. We, you know, we, we don't get to help George Bush architect a war. Right. Right. We don't get invited by Barack Obama to tell us what you know real Americans think. <laughs> <laughs> like five or six times, like David Brooks was, you know, every yeah. couple yeah. of weeks he's up yeah. at the White House. Right, right. And and it, it is incredibly insulting to um, that influence, that un- completely undeserved influence that, for example, here's, I, I can boil David Brooks' entire Atlantic article down into, you know, two lines. Once upon a time, there was a 16th century. Mm-hmm. And then Burke and Locke came along. Mm-hmm. And then Bill <laughs> Buckley came along. And then yada, yada, yada. <laughs> And then Donald Trump and and Tucker Carlson, what the fuck happened to my movement? Yeah. There's a whole big missing piece in there called David Brooks' entire adult life. And his career in writing. His career, exactly. And it's that that and it's it's missing from the biography of everyone who 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 walks this path. Charlie Sykes doesn't like to talk about it. Tom Nichols swears it had nothing to do with him. Michael Steele swears he had they were racist before me and after me, but when I was there. The Republican Party wasn't racist because yeah. they think of themselves as aristocrats first. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, no one said first. the N word at my cocktail party fundraisers. They were well, at bondage themed nightclubs, but yeah. no one said the N word. Right. But they right. think of themselves as virtuous and virtuous people aren't racist. Therefore, the Republican Party isn't racist. Right. Because right. I'm a member of the Republican Party. I'm a conservative. Right. right. And, and getting punched in the mouth over and over again by reality has altered their perception of conservatism since 2016 mm-hmm. but it hasn't changed their mind about what happened before that and they're still will they will still move heaven and earth not to talk about how we got to where we are and i don't know any problem that's ever been solved when people say okay first we need to all agree that we're not going to talk about what caused the problem right no right. that's exactly where you start and you, you can't start in 2016 you got to start way before that and you bring up, you want to get shut down, bring up Newt Gingrich, bring yeah. up Rush Limbaugh. Man, right. they, that is right. the end of that conversation because they will not talk about it because it it implicates them. Dr- Drift Glass, I, uh-huh. I need to flip over to the other side of the Republican uh, noise machine from David Brooks. Oh. And talk about Matt Gates for a minute. Matt Gates. Oh, I've heard of him. Yeah. yeah. He's a congressman yeah. from Florida. And uh, I was going to make a funny joke in our show today about Matt Gates because mm-hmm. a day or so ago, Matt Gates had a press conference with Louis Gohmert and Marjorie Taylor Greene, in which he said, "I know this joke. I know this joke. <laughs> they didn't walk into a bar because no, I'm pretty no, sure I know this joke." No. no, he said, "We are going to take power after this next election, and when we do." It's not going to be like the days of Paul Ryan. It's going to be the days of Jim Jordan, Marjorie Green, Dr. Gosar, and myself. Mm-hmm. And I thought it was really nice of Matt Gates to make a, a midterm ad for the Democratic National Committee. Bless. <laughs> and that was going to be my joke, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, a couple of hours ago, Matt Gates appeared on the Steve Bannon podcast. <gasps> I was just going to mention Steve Bannon. So please, after you. And uh, apparently Matt Gates, like a lot of Republicans, thinks you can go on the Steve Bannon podcast and no one else is listening to you well, except Steve it, Bannon fans. It won't, it won't make it into the, you know, 
no one will report on it except you, me, and Hal Sparks. So, well, uh, no. Apparently, um, what Matt Gates had to say with Steve Bannon on the podcast, a lot of people are listening to today uh, uh. because uh, Matt Gates and Steve Bannon discussed preparing four thousand shock troops to man the government after the twenty twenty four election. Uh huh. Um, they said they will hit the beach with landing teams if Trump wins in 2024 with 4,000 shock troops to control the government for Trumpism. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> that's some pretty... Uh, well, explicit treason? Explicit yeah. treason of yeah. planning out loud to th- overthrow the government. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll just... I'm going to... I'm pretty sure threatening government officials is a federal offense, but uh, and certainly he should be thrown out of the Congress for saying that. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, I just wanted to. Uh, it's not funny anymore. Let me just put it that way. Uh, well, all all the big thinkers on the right used to go on Bill Buckley's show, uh-huh. and now all the big thinkers on the right go on the Steve Bannon show. Um, and the reason I'm going to bring this back around very quickly is that. Uh, Steve Bannon also had Marjorie Taylor Greene on his show. Oh, see, they're all. And, that's this is where the Trump people are going. Yeah, yeah. and um, uh, he mentioned that David Brooks singled her out as the problem. Ah, <laughs> and she went ballistic. <laughs> he doesn't get to define Trumpism. I represent the American people. These are the same people they look down on. They're the same people they forgot about. The same people they can't even relate to because they're so stuck up, because they're so highly educated, and because they think they're so much better than everyone. All right, now, so all that's true of David Brooks. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to lie. He's these these never Trumpers are, as we said before, monarchists. Mm-hmm. They are they're mm-hmm. aristocrats. They they yeah. are they it, it is they consider it an incredible sacrifice on their part to share a park bench with us dirty hippies. Yeah. Even though it's our or park bench. Or there's dirty fascists on the le- on the right as well. They don't well, want to share with them either. Well, they're the ones who are now grudgingly willing to maybe sometimes uh, approve of Democrats or at least say we're in alliance with them. But they really want us to clear out the good room and, and give yeah. them all the furniture and, and huddle in the basement because – just being in our presence is horrifying to them. Well, and lucrative campaign jobs belong to them, regardless yes. of, and and Trump people won't hire them, so mm-hmm. we have to insist that Democrats hire us to run their campaigns for them. Right. Well, and and you have, you know, you have uh, Matt Gates. I have uh, Matt Dowd. You thought I was having a heart attack when I found out that about this other Matthew story. <laughs> yes, I thought. Oh and no, poor, Drif- poor Driftglass. He he. Since Junior Dude had a car accident, everybody's fine. Yeah. On Halloween, Junior Dude had a car accident. He's fine. Everybody's fine. But since that time, Drift Glass answers the phone. Are you all right? Yes. Just <laughs> and and twill ever be thus. Yeah. <laughs> so when I hear from across, well, our house is like four hundred thousand square feet. No, so it's not. It's, it's like, like Tom Friedman's estate. Twenty one hundred you know? square feet. Yeah. So when we I have hear a very small house, we do. We do. And most of that is above, uh, below us or above us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so when I hear from another room, oh my God, <laughs> uh, my reaction is that, you know, something that's, probably cute. That's what it was too. So oh my there's, God. There's a cute, cute, probably cute cat uh, video. Uh, no, no. <laughs> it was uh, Matthew Dowd who has decided that uh, uh, he's going to bow out of his race for Lieutenant governor. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it comes from a place, as he said, of integrity mm-hmm. uh, because yeah. there's no, Praise higher than the praise you give yourself for doing something. <laughs> um, he's not going to wait for someone else to notice what a yeah. man of integrity he is. He's going yeah. to do it himself. And it's uh, because there, uh, he realized that all of this talk about diversity, uh, he's just another white guy in this race and it needs to be more diverse. So he's well, going an to- African American, a qualified African American woman announced she's running. Yeah. So he is bowing out and that is, that's a good reason, but- I don't believe um, it for a fucking over minute. overflowing with self praise for doing yeah. this. God, this, I'm so good. This is something that you know I've had to watch myself about, and I've talked to you about in the past. Which is, we in our zeal to be anti racist, uh-huh. often language slips in of we're letting black people do such and right. such, right? And it's like, and that was laid on thick. 
<laughs> in Matthew Dowd's in his, statement. In his long, long In between press the release. lines was, and I'm going to let her win. Yeah. 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 Well, and, and the thing is, uh, this is a guy who deleted 145,000, 170,000 yeah. of his own tweets. Yeah. So that no one would ask him any questions about what he's been doing for the last 13 years. Right. About the so, corrupt duopoly. Yeah. <laughs> and about, you know, bagging on Hillary and then yeah. stealing her platform mm-hmm. and changing his <laughs> mind and attacking people who said that the things he's saying now – uh, were terrible back then. Uh, just a you know, complete windsock of a human being. Whichever mm-hmm. way the wind is blowing, that's what he believes in today. Right. And the fact that he now is full of integrity. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's going to get him back on MSNBC. Oh, sure. well, he already way. has been. Steve I saw him Schmidt. on there yesterday. Oh, really? I, oh my I saw God. Him, I saw him there yesterday. And so uh, he's left the lieutenant governor race to spend more time with his MSNBC family. And that's mm-hmm. just adorable. Um, but first of all, as long as the Lincoln Project is taking credit for everything, mm-hmm. I think I should take credit for Matthew uh, Dowd leaving the race. Oh, really? For being one of the lone voices out there who said, wait a minute, is anybody else asking this guy about all the shit he said over the last 13 years? That Well, and directly... you had embedded enough of his tweets that the text still showed up. Yeah. That you're, we were able to cut and paste a lot of that and put it at Crooks and Liars. Yeah. And like, oh, no, it's still there, Matt. We it's just still have there. to go digging for it. Yeah, it, it's gone from the original place, um, right. which and I understand why you deleted gone. it. Yeah, but yeah. It, the original text is there. Yeah, and um, so I would like to see his internal poll numbers ah. uh, on the eve of his announcement that he's doing. He's being the bigger mm-hmm. man by yeah. stepping aside because I don't believe for one goddamn minute that he stepped out of that race because he's trying to open the door for the little lady. Yeah, I think yeah. he is very much a, a a an amoral political creature who will go wherever the power center takes him. Mm-hmm. And r- I have a feeling that he the numbers were not looking good, and it's just easier to go on MSNBC and 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 bitch about you know the fact that left doesn't take the threat seriously enough, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and have Nicole Wallace stroke his stroke his brow and call him you know call him a wonderful man. That's just an easier life than running for office. Now, I might be wrong, but until I see his internal poll numbers on the eve of his resignation, uh, there's no way for me to know that. All Um, right. I'm going to read a letter from a listener, Drift Glass. Please do. Hey, Drift Glass and Blue Gal. I'm a quiet but devoted listener. And yes, I also listen to the Bulwark, so I always know what Drift Glass is ranting about. (laughs) (laughs) Uh I live in Columbus, Ohio, a big blue dot in what used to be and still should be a purple state. I grew up a farm girl and a product of a Catholic grade school, high school, and college education in the 1980s. That means I'm a social justice Catholic. I send my son to Catholic school and I attend mass as often as possible, but I grew up in an extended family of conservative Republican Protestants who wouldn't vote for Mitt Romney because he wasn't a true Christian. Oh my gosh. Wow. I lived for six years in the Boston area where I met people who constantly confused my home state with Iowa because they both gave four, have four letters in corn. Yeah. <laughs> my formerly conservative husband from New York is now a reliable progressive adopted Ohioan. He served in the Persian Gulf and drug wars in South America. We have two children. Our youngest child has Down syndrome. We knew this prenatally and chose to continue with the pregnancy. For these reasons and more, we don't fit neatly into the progressive liberal stereotype, but we have and live strong progressive liberal values, and that's the reason I love your podcast. So thank you for all you do to amplify our voices, voices from the heartland that often get overlooked by the Democratic Party and by progressive liberal groups in general, and thank you for reaching out. I'm going to buy you some more coffee. (laughs) (laughs) My best, Jay. And thank you, Jay, for writing. She uh, may not fit into the stereotype, but uh, Jay, you definitely fit into the tradition of Dorothy Day and the nuns on the bus. Yes, she does. So uh, there is a very strong tradition of social justice Catholics and so forth. And so in honor of Dorothy Day and the nuns on the bus, I would like to do a Bible bitch today. Oh, please. Bible bitch. That's not scriptural. And uh, I'm going to do the Magnificat because, you know, BVM, baby. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The Blessed Virgin Mary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, This week is uh, 
the uh, annunciation and so forth uh, going on in the church uh, universal in, as part of Advent. And um, or if you watch cable, it's Blessed Vir- Virgin Mary Smackdown on <laughs> Sunday, <laughs> Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so, but I'm going to read it from the message and the way the message translates, this is beautiful. Um, listen for the social justice in what Mary says. Ooh. Mm-hmm. to Elizabeth. This is uh, Luke 1, 46 to 55. And Mary said, I'm bursting with God news. I'm dancing the song of my Savior God. God took one good look at me and look what happened. I'm the most fortunate woman on earth. What God has done for me will never be forgotten. His mercy flows in wave after wave on those who are in awe before him. He bared his arm and showed his strength, scattered the bluffing braggarts. He knocked tyrants off their high horses, pulled victims out of the mud. The starving poor sat down to a banquet. The callous rich were left out in the cold. He embraced his chosen child. He remembered and piled on the mercies, piled them high. It's exactly what he promised beginning with Abraham and right up to now. We know where the bluffing braggarts are. They're all <laughs> on the Steve Bannon podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, Most of them talking I hope about it's a Jesus. bluff. I mean, yeah. come on, this is absurd. What's happening right now is just it's time for uh, Department of Justice to smack down some to of this swoop crap. in like Batman and start yeah. kicking ass. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm not holding that breath. No. I, you know, I, I remember when it was just going to, any day, any hour now, Carl Rove's going to be marched out in handcuffs and we're yeah. going to have Fitzmas. We it's going to be Fitzmas. That, right? Patrick Fitzmas. Fitzmas. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't, I don't wait on those things anymore because yeah. it is not the tradition of institution loving um, government employees to arrest people in high office or charge them with anything. It's mm-hmm. just, it goes against their ingrained, terrible, terrible habits. I, I'm glad, you know, if we had a, uh, if we had a, a justice department that couldn't be turned against political enemies by either side, I'm right. fine with that. Right. But right. if we play by the rules and they don't, we lose. Right. 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 Um, but thank you for that letter and uh, the reminder. And well, and I'll mention since uh, Jay from Columbus does listen to the Bulwark, um, I will mention that um, in uh, in a post I will write at some point in the future to be entitled "Never Trumpers and Their Discontents." I, I had trouble deciding who was the more pompous and ridiculous, uh, Mona Charon on her Bulwark podcast, or Tom Nichols as guest of Charlie Sykes's Bulwark podcast. Because both of them are really disgusted with having to sit, you know, share any space or oxygen with the left. And it just, it's, there's now a regular feature about how awful the left is and how dumb we are and how inconsiderate we are and how we don't realize how lucky we are to have them on our side and how we need to shut up and do what they tell us. So this week, I'll just, I'll cut to the chase. Mona Sharon's advice for Joe Biden was he needs to pick a fight and be seen as, you know, a, a champion and a, an aggressor. And the, the the fight that with her with the left, with like AOC, Joe Biden needs to pick a fight with his own base to show some centrist, moderate, never Trump, whatever, that he's, you know, he's that guy. Now, the example she picked was like Ronald Reagan. You remember <laughs> when he when he picked a fight with Patco and broke up the air traffic control, you know, like wait a minute. Oh, that was a good thing to destroy well, a, the unions? Well, of course if you were a, you know, raging right winger like Mona Charon, yes, unions are bad. They should be destroyed. B, Patco wasn't Reagan's base. No. <laughs> they were the other side of the aisle. Reagan picked a fight with his ideological opponents and used the power of the federal government to destroy them. Yeah. That is if you think Joe Biden should pick a fight with a Republican out there somewhere mm-hmm. and use the power of the federal government to wreck them, I'm with you. But but to suggest that, A, this was really popular, everyone loved it, and B, that's no. how Joe Biden can show what a man he is by what? By punching his own base. It's like, you really hate 
Democrats, don't you? You really mm-hmm. hate liberals. Mm-hmm. And this is, it just, she can't tolerate being in the same room, in the same political room with people like us. She hates yeah. us. And yeah. it is, it is horrifying to her. It's, it shows that God is not in his heaven, that she's forced to occupy space with the likes of us. So the best thing Joe Biden could do to make her happy is punch you and me in the mouth, which I don't think he's going to do. Tom yeah. Nichols was even more ridiculous. He's like, you know, these leftists and their like Drumpf and the GQP and the Orange Menace. I mean, that's not taking it seriously. They need oh, to grow the hell up and take it seriously. If you the former guy, you're not taking politics seriously. That's right. That's okay. right. Which is going to come as a shock to, you know, Charlie Chaplin. Yeah, right. <laughs> who mocked Hitler on film. Right, and it's, right. But it's this kind of fussy, um, aristocratic, these these little people and their stupid little jokes are insulting to a giant brain like mine. A giant brain, I might add, that didn't fucking notice the Republican Party was full of lunatics until five minutes ago. Mm-hmm. And who now is just hauling his bloated ass over to my side of the aisle and ordering people around over here to tell him to stop saying this and stop doing that. And of course, I'm getting whiplash from the number of conservatives who six years ago told liberals we were being alarmist crackpots and who now tell the same liberals, you guys aren't taking the threat seriously enough. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, and, and they've never missed a meal. Yeah, These fuckers right. have never missed a meal. Right. They're, right. They've gone from being dead wrong to being the most righteous resistance fighters who know the only way forward for democracy is for the people who were right all along to shut up and do what they're told. You know who and, was right all along? People who said health care is important. Yeah. You know who said health care is not important and we should kill it in, in the cradle? Bill Crystal. Yeah. Yeah. He's the reason there was no Hillary care. Right. And, right. you know, now he's our stalwart ally. No, it, you, no. Can, you get to be an ally, but you got to go to the back of the fucking line That's and do what the we point. The, the point is, you know, the, none of these folks ever had to put their kids on Medicaid. No, ever. Ever. Or they never struggle suffered. with a pharmacy to get, you know, coverage for their kids medication i mean that's that's where i go with that's where my brain goes with this because that's so personal to me and that's where i've been and you know we just had the letter from the person who knew she was having a downs kid and she went ahead and did right based on her faith and her love for kids and whatever her choice was this was her choice and now we have a party that takes away choice and doesn't care about women and doesn't care about health care for long long-term disabled children into adulthood and it's being defended by these very wealthy very privileged white people who think as you say that they should be the ones at the table making decisions for everybody and uh sorry mona you're well, you know you destroyed uh the ability of workers to support themselves for 40 years mm-hmm you stagnated wages for 40 years and we're done. If you think PACO was a good idea and was an example of Ronald Reagan doing the right thing, fuck you. And honestly, I am tired of their liberal defenders. Yeah. You know yeah. You know what? It, because it never occurs to them. It's so inculcated into them as the kid who gets beat up and having their lunch money taken that maybe it's the people who were wrong all along who should be doing all the compromising. Mm-hmm. Maybe the people mm-hmm. who were wrong all along, who should be taking, who, who should be in the back of the room, being quiet, doing what they're told. It's always the left who has to compromise. Yeah. Well, because, all I'm saying is never trust a never Trumper. You know what? And certainly don't trust a Republican. I couldn't agree more. That's um, why we. That's why we have this wonderful podcast. So we can. Speaking of which, things like that. never mm-hmm. trusting. You know who never trusts a never Trumper or a Republican? The youths of today. The youth of today. They have uh, decided. Yeah. Um, that all the usual suspects are mopey and sad over this Axios story, Drift Glass. Mm-hmm. Well, young Democrats, and I can tell you we have three young Democrats in our house. This is true of all of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are not going to date Republicans. Nope. <laughs> uh, nearly a quarter of college students wouldn't be friends with someone who had voted for the other presidential candidates, with Democrats far more likely to dismiss people than Republicans. Axios is wringing their hands over this. Mm-hmm. 5% of Republicans said they wouldn't be friends with someone who voted for Biden, but 37% of Democrats said they wouldn't be friends with someone who voted for Trump. 
mm-hmm. because Trump voters are racist. Yeah, there's the there's the part this is that the part well, their Axios is leaving out. <laughs> we're we're, gonna, we're getting to the punchline, so yeah. don't you worry. Just uh, keep rolling the numbers out. Seventy one percent of Democrats wouldn't go on a date with someone who voted for Trump. Thirty one percent of Republicans wouldn't go on a date with someone who voted for Biden. Thirty percent of Democrats and seven percent of Republicans wouldn't even work for someone who voted differently from them. So one third of Democrats won't work for a Trump voter. And think about that. Of course you wouldn't. If you could prove at all, avoid it. But the thing that makes it art, this is, why don't you read this part? Well, yeah. The thing that makes it art is how fanatically Axios is clinging to both siderism. Because in the story, there's a part called why it matters. And according to Axios, the reason it matters, the takeaway from these stats is partisan divides. As each side inhabits parallel political culture and media universes, makes a future of discord and distrust in the U.S. all the more likely. See, Blue Gal, there's no actual morality involved in your no, policy right. differences or fascism <laughs> or racism. It's just that both sides occupy different different universes, and that's very sad. The bubble, yeah, they really should get out. Young people should get out of their political and cultural bubbles mm-hmm. and get to know one another. No, I think young Democrats know exactly who young Trump voters are. Yeah, this is. And if you say Kyle Rittenhouse is innocent, yeah, you're not going to get any. No. <laughs> Well, and this is something that that we've said off and on for years, which is Mm -hmm. conservatives understand liberals. The way conservatives understand liberals is because they have listened to Rush Limbaugh for 30 years. Right, right. The reason we liberals understand conservatives is we've listened to Rush Limbaugh for 30 years. We know exactly what these fuckers think. And that's the part of the equation that is just, I trip over every time, is that we absolutely understood the Republican Party was a racist reactionary party. And could not because figure Rush out. Because Rush Limbaugh told us. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and I just wanted to grab David Brooks by his fluorescent tie and throttle him and say, "Are you? Do you know who Rush Limbaugh is? Have you ever listened to him for more than thirty seconds?" And he of admits course, on, he admits on the the uh, PBS show. No, I never listened to no, Rush. Never Limbaugh. listened to him. I don't know. And, and he he, yeah. you know, he would literally wave his hand and say, "Oh, New Gingrich, I wouldn't trust him to run a Seven Eleven." Uh, yeah. Rush Limbaugh, you know. But it's like that's your party. Mm-hmm. You're not the fucking party. You're well, and the, that's you're, the problem is that you're the, Donald Trump made it impossible for David Brooks to wave that politics away. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Which he was yeah. doing. I might. I must remind you, as recently as 2014. Right. David Brooks was saying in the New York Times that the Republican Party's doing fine. They yeah. detoxified their brand. Nothing but blue skies ahead. Everything's great. And then like it's gonna be Rubio. Yeah. And then seven <laughs> months later, Donald Trump comes down the escalator. Yeah. And the whole party leaps into his lap. Yeah. And yep. it, it is I've never I've never heard of a profession where someone can be that big a lying fuck up or just not know what the hell they're doing for decades and, and keep getting money shoved at them. And David Brooks and the rest of them refuse to analyze Republican primary voters. Oh they refuse to talk about Republican primary voters. Oh no, they do. I remember him on the Charlie Rose show saying, you know, I don't have a machine to look into people's souls, Charlie, <laughs> but I can, I, I'm pretty sure this isn't about race. You know, this, I'm pretty sure pretty based sure? on, based on the quiet car, and the Acela quarter I take every day yeah. and the three friends I have on either side of me who are both moderate, you know, Romney Republicans. I'm pretty sure the Republican party isn't racist, Charlie. And now it's like, oh man. Put on a plaid flannel shirt and go sit in a diner in Southern Illinois. Well, and, and we have yeah. to, at this point, mention that Fred Hyatt has died. Uh, Fred Hyatt was the op-ed page editor of the Washington Post for a very long time, for decades. And all of the people that Fred Hyatt gave work to have nice things to say about Fred Hyatt. <laughs> Which is not surprising, because being given a permanent op-ed gig in a major newspaper is a very sweet deal. So all the people that Fred Hyatt gave this very sweet deal to have very nice things to say about Fred Hyatt. He loved freedom more than anything, Blue Gal. <laughs> uh, but what Fred Hyde did at the Washington Post, for the most part, is create a neoconservative pro-war petting zoo yeah. and stock yeah. it with the worst people in America. Yep. And it was yep. just one pro-right, hate-left, let's go to war, let's kick some ass voice after another, after mm-hmm. another, after mm-hmm. another. And even after it all fell apart. I mean, Mark Thiessen, unreconstructed torture pimp Mark Thiessen, still has a column there. Yeah. 
And he really turned the Washington Post op-ed page into an arm of the of the neoconservative Weekly Standard yep. foreign policy branch. Yep. And they had no time for for you know crazy liberals who didn't love America. And Fred Hyatt never lost his job, and none of the assholes who wrote for him ever missed a meal. And that's what you can do when you've reached the top of the pile, and you can do things like that. That's what we mean when we say influence. I I, I would be shocked if people who get their news off the phone or from Stephen Colbert know who the hell Fred Hyatt right, was. Right. But he had right. an enormous amount of influence over the opinions that got the that center got right opinions of Washington D.C. Yeah. In the lead up to the Iraq War, absolutely. That got normalized absolutely. into policy in right. Washington D.C. that over affected over actual again. people's lives. Yep. 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 And I guess we have Fred, Fred Hyatt to thank for the fact that the blogosphere got started. Yes. <laughs> There's yes, that. We do. <laughs> All right. Three items in news you might have missed. Uh, there are boycotts of HelloFresh and Kellogg cereals. And Kellogg cereals, you want to go look that up because they make a lot of stuff. They own they a lot of products. Mm-hmm. Including including cheeses and uh, other things, kashi, a lot of other foods um, over union busting because those companies are engaged in union busting. Uh, we want to congratulate the uh, Starbucks in Buffalo, New York, which has unionized. Uh, this is a pro union house, by the way. In Very case much you so. didn't know, Very uh, much. there's an article in the Atlantic that uh, Rachel Maddow read this week. Uh, that's terrifying about how mm-hmm. January 6th was a practice run. Mm-hmm. Um, Tucker Carlson and Newsmax, uh, their teleprompters this week appear to be run by the Kremlin now. So, yeah. uh, you know, congratulations, Vladimir Putin. You've got a, a, a couple of outlets mm-hmm. Pop it on a string. in the United States. Absolutely. Uh, and why don't we do a news roundup, Drew Fest? Sure. Well, let's start with preliminary lab reports that suggest that three doses of the Pfizer coronavirus vaccine offer significant protection against the Omicron variant. Jobless claims have hit a 52-year, Y-E-A-R, year low. At 184,000 claims adjusted for seasonal swings, it was the lowest level of initial claims since September of 1969. You know, that's back when the Beatles were doing Get Back and stuff. That's right. Right? We just saw that documentary. That yeah, we- yeah. Uh, when the figure stood at 182,000 in September 1969. This is what we're calling the Biden boom. It is the Biden boom. I, the Biden I don't think boom. I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be part of it. I'm happy to be uh, doing, my, doing my infrastructure bit of it. Uh, the U.S. House of Representatives approved legislation to create a one-time pathway for Senate Democrats to unilaterally raise the debt ceiling without Republican support Republicans who have refused to drop their blockade against legislation to raising the borrowing cap long term in protest of Biden's economic agenda. This is such a weird strategy from McConnell, unless you consider how much of his holdings are in Chinese shipping. Also, he knows, as we noted last week, the government shutdowns are always blamed on Republicans because people like Lauren Boebert brag about it. That's right. Mm hmm. Biden signed an executive order to cut the federal government's carbon emissions 65 percent by the end of the decade and to become entirely carbon neutral by 2050. Mm -hmm. Many on the environmental left are likening this to a teenager promising to clean up his room in 30 years. And um, I understand that it but that is their job to push Biden to the left. Yeah. And uh, more power to them. I hope they're successful. Um. But that's that's what their job is. And I do recommend if you're uh, an environmental leftist who really wants to push Biden to the left on these things, Common Dreams is the blog to look at for that. Um, They do a lot of uh, write ups on how we're not doing enough for the environment. Uh, The House Select Committee investigating the January 6th attack on the Capitol will move to hold Mark Meadows in criminal contempt for refusing to appear for a scheduled deposition. In a pure Trump suck-up move, Trump's former chief of staff, who has already turned over thousands of pages of documents, told the panel to go fuck themselves. <laughs> that he was no longer willing to sit for a deposition reversing a cooperation deal he had already reached with the panel last week. And they've got a copy of his book, too. So yeah. he's, a, he's able to go on Hannity and publish a book, but he's not going to talk to the committee. Okay. Oh, well, that, that's the plan. Yep. And he's suing Pelosi, which is yeah. hilarious. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
the House passed a $768 billion defense policy bill. But what about inflation, Drew Glass? Shut up. Roughly $24 billion above what Biden had requested. What about the deficit, Drift Glass? You know what? You, you liberals and your fucking consistency. The bill, blah, blah, blah. which sets the policy agenda and authorizes funding, now moves to the Senate where it's expected to pass this week. What about the debt ceiling, Drift Glass? Uh, fun fact, President Joe Manchin did not go over this bill asking for about the uh, inflation or the deficit or the debt ceiling or nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. He didn't want anything cut out of it, like specific carve outs before he would support it. Did nope. he want a CBO score, Drift Class? Nope. Nope. Never asked for any of that. Hmm. It's weird. Hmm. Weird, isn't weird. it? Weird. Because that's, yeah. that's, that's uh, if my math is correct, I got to take my shoes and socks off to be sure. We didn't count up that high, but uh, that's nearly a trillion dollars. That's a whole lot of money. And yet all the questions that are being, all the bullshit questions that Joe mm -hmm. Manchin is pulling out of his ass to, mm -hmm. to screw over Democrats, because he doesn't like Democrats. Um, ha, do uh, do not apply here. Yep. Nothing. None well, of this their... is why I want to just surrender and say, okay, we're going to put all of the soft infrastructure stuff in the in defense the, bill. In the defense bill, yeah, make it, it. make it a six trillion dollar bill. Yeah, and let's have that conversation. Yeah, and then put Bernie Sanders in charge of auditing every nickel that goes right. into the Pentagon. Right. right. Um, the Biden administration announced a diplomatic boycott of the 2022 Winter Olympics in Beijing, citing China's ongoing genocide and crimes against humanity in Jingzhang and other human rights abuses. The Justice Department appears to have finally bestirred itself and is doing something about voting rights. This week, they have sued Texas over its plan to redock congressional and state legislative voting districts. Actually, they've sued him for the second time, alleging mm -hmm. that the Republican-led legislators' redistricting plan district plans disenfranchise Hispanic minorities and Latino minorities in violation of the Voting Rights Act. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the metadata in a draft letter written by a Trump Justice Department official indicates some involvement with the White House in Trump's failed attempt to overturn the 2020 election. Oh. Yeah, shocking. Sidney Powell, uh, the Kraken lawyer, has mm -hmm. raised more than $14 million off of her baseless claims of voter fraud in the 2020 election. You and I would both be dead by the time this podcast makes. Well, I think we, we have to stick with her defense, uh, <laughs> which is that no reasonable person would believe all A the crazy we shit we say on this podcast. <laughs> Powell is currently being sued by one point three for $1.3 billion by Dominion Voting Systems for defamation over her claims that the company rigged the election against Trump. Her defense is that, no kidding, no reasonable person would believe that her false conspiracies about widespread election fraud were statements of fact. So she's doing the Tucker Carlson defense. Yeah, it's it's yeah. it's one step beyond pleading insanity. It's like I'm a lying lunatic. Yeah. I'm completely irresponsible. And, and that'll get me out of out of paying. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh speaking of lying lunatics, Devin Nunez has resigned from Congress to become CEO of Trump's soon to be failed media company. It's a Zappadan miracle. It is. It's a Zappadan miracle. By the way, Zappadan it runs from December 4th to December 21st. December 4th is known as Bummer Knocked. It's the day Frank Zappa died, the anniversary of his passing. Mm -hmm. And December 21st is Frank Zappa's birthday. And so we celebrate Zappa Dan, the mythical time when there was no Frank. That, that, <laughs> that short period on earth when there was we no Frank. We Frank alive during those that period of time between death and birth. Yes, we um, do. <laughs> it's just a fun thing to do, to it celebrate is. Zappa Dan. And you should celebrate and expect miracles. Expect miracles. That's during true. During Zappadan. And anything and, good that happens, make sure you chalk it up. It's a Zappadan miracle. The Biden, the Biden boom, a Zappadan miracle. A Zappadan miracle. Okay. Mm -hmm. Georgia Republicans have purged black Democrats from county election boards. Yes. This is, Fuck those people. This is, well, if I were on camera, you could see my shocked face. This yeah, is so shocking well, to yeah. me. Yeah. In local news, Junior Dude last week was a hit. Yeah. 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 Thank we, you, everybody, for your feedback on that. I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. He enjoyed it. And uh, we'll have him on again yeah. during midterms and stuff. I We did ask him because uh, Devin Nunez retiring. And I said, does that have anything to do with him being, you know, losing Republican votes in his district? And Junior Dude just looked at me and said, Mom, 
the California map hasn't been approved yet. Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, woman. <laughs> Read a book, for God's sake. <laughs> Like, yeah. Oh, excuse me. Well, and as <laughs> we're going to bring him back to the midterms with a a white shirt, a loosened tie, and a whiteboard, and yeah, and a pair ca- of khakis, <laughs> and just have him cranking on these numbers all night long. So he will too. Yeah, he we'll will. Do it. Uh, each week we post to our Facebook page and website an internet kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's internet kitty is known as the little man. The little man. The little man is, and his human acknowledges this. A grumpy kitty. Now, Drift Glass, you and I had Zeppo for many years. We did. And she she was a grumpy kitty too. They they exist. They do. They do. Um, but uh, the little man has his box to sit in. Uh huh. And he refuses to speak to the media under any circumstances. Wise move. That's why uh, I will sit in my box and refuse to speak to the media. Yes. Of course, the little man eats freshly poured cat food. Our fake sponsor. Whether you serve pet store perfection or dollar store direct, your cats will sit on the kitchen floor or in their box and demand that the food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh, my Lord, it's freshly poured. And you can visit the little man at our Facebook page or website. You can send your internet kitty, dog, or other pet to us at our email address, prolefpodcast at gmail.com, where you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go Postal Unions. Letter on the air, unless you say otherwise. Hashtag, the joys days are numbered. Yeah! Yeah! Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job. And we love our job. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. We're looking to make that, you know, sweet, sweet 14 million. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is episode 60,422 <laughs> of the Professional Up Podcast. We're going to become the Kraken Podcast, and then we'll do it, right? <laughs> Broadcasting from the free states of <laughs> Nanana, Alaska. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, again, approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. A uh, lot of blogs and so forth have their handout this time of year. Uh, yeah. We want you to know how much we appreciate uh, your supporting this show. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All the information to support the show is at proleftpod.com. Please share our show on social media. And if you love this podcast, please get someone else to listen to. And thank you so much for doing that. Hey, Drift Class, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Well, Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties always have and always will ignore congressional subpoenas. That's just how they roll. Let's think about living. Think about living. Let's think about loving. Think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, loving, dubbing. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. Professional F Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2021 DGBG Productions.